Okay, so my next question was, <clears throat> do you think uh, FW could be taught in school 10 years? And uh, at the same time, are you for gender segregated schools or not, and why? Two questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it could be taught in school. It probably won't be taught properly in school. Notice my lack of trust for school systems. Mm -hmm. Because there's, you know, just like now they're teaching gender neutrality. And, you know, they teach all kinds of stuff. And uh, it could be. I wouldn't really trust it. But it could be, theoretically. And segregated mm -hmm. schools... And don't we have a teacher who wants to, we do have a teacher in Texas who wants to teach FW, sort of. She wants yeah, but it's, it's college, yeah. She's a college yeah. professor. And, it, and it's a Bible college. And so she asked me if she could teach with all the Christian scriptures, and I said, sure. Of course. Because she's got all Christian students, so yeah. But uh, segregated schools? Uh, well, it sure increases the... Uh, it increases the interest in the opposite sex. <laughs> yeah. You know, my mother never thought that that was the ideal thing to do. Uh, I don't know, from an economic point of view, I don't know how that could work. My mother was all for, I don't know in Russia how they do it, but she was so impressed in Australia and England because they wore uniforms to school. And she said that, that helped children to encourage them to have better behavior when they were dressed up more. And she tried to get it in our school, and of course it didn't work. Well, it reduces some of the uh, kind of the um, cliquishness of some kids maybe who can afford, afford nice better clothes. clothes than others. And, and yeah. all these sloppy clothes that children wear, at least in this country. I don't know if they do in Russia, but mm -hmm. here they wear, they look, some kids look really sloppy when they go to school, and that encourages more sloppy behavior. So, but she never talked about segregated, and I guess I don't know what the great advantage would be there. There are several scientists who compare results and say that, in general, for most of the of the pupils, it's better to be taught in segregated schools, but not for all, like. I think two thirds and one third, something like this. I think I think families are the number one place where I learned where I learned the most important things in my life was at home. It wasn't at school mm. or church. I learned most about spirituality at home and self study, not at church. I learned some things, but not the most important things because I wasn't there all the time. I was at home all the time. So that's where I learned when I could ask my mother, what about this? My father, what about that? What's true about this? I didn't ask that stuff in church or at school. I was shy. They would sit and discuss something with you. Yeah. Uh, take more time than probably you might get at a school when there's so many me. when there's so many students wanting time. They cared about you in particular and would talk to you. I'm asking because in Russia, for example, uh, we have several initiative groups who try to um, introduce some kind of a, of, a, of a subject, an official, on the federal level, a subject uh, to to make family families better, uh, more families, and so on. Like it's it's called in different names sometimes, like uh, 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 lessons in uh, family happiness. Sometimes they some somehow interconnected with religion. Sometimes not because it's a touchy subject in Russia because they also have multiple religions. To have governments help in raising children because they don't love them, they don't know them, and they don't love them. And you're lumping people into one big group, and people are not the same. You know these any feminists that say all men are bad, or, or men that say all women are bad, all of any group of people are not one thing. All Jews are not one thing. All Muslims are not one thing. Everybody is individual. Yeah. And so to lump everybody is kind of lazy in some ways. It's easier maybe to say, well, I think all Jews are, I don't know what people say all Jews are bad, but um, because I don't, I don't know any Jews that are bad. I only know nice ones. So I, <laughs> me too. I don't know. I don't know 
any group of people that I would say are all a certain way. Even, even there's no group of people that are all wonderful. Uh, there's everybody's individual. So I think statistics are always a little bit uh, challenging. You know, you can say, well, this statistic, I think we talked a little bit before about my political polls. Well, if you knew that you jump out of an airplane and there's a 50% chance of dying, you know, I thought if the airplane was crashing, that makes a total difference. Or if I thought I was going to help save someone's life, I'd probably take the risk. But you know, if we went on statistics and said, well, if you, if you start a new business, your chances are absolutely horrible. Statistically, don't start a new business. Nobody would do one. And so to me, to, to build your life on statistics is, is a difficult way to go. I hate to see the, the government say, okay, they've got to decide how families should be better. I personally like to directly talk to the families the individuals themselves and help them build their marriages and their families and and have it be a grassroots thing rather than something that the government has to do. Well, governments don't love your children. They don't. They're just a name. It's just a number. It's not your child. And so, for a government to come in and tell me what my child must do or not do, mm -hmm. and you think, but you don't know my child. They're autistic. They need yeah. special help with this. And they may say, well, our Tests show that they're not. Well, their tests may be wrong. So it's, it's, it's dangerous to have governments. This is what I was talking about with my German friend. She said they're so socialistic in their country that they have people that can come in. They have to decide whether your child is sick enough to stay home. Parents don't get to decide. That's dangerous. Because it depends on the per people coming in. They don't ha all have the same exact standards. It depends on the group of people who decide. They may, they may not like those parents and want to take their children from them. They may like them and want to give them more consideration than somebody else. It's, it's a dangerous way to do things, in my opinion. It's taking things away from the family. I think we believe that anything that undermines the basic family unit mm -hmm. is, not, is not really in the long term good for civilization. Now, sometimes a government will say, well, we want to help families. We want to do things that promote and, and encourage families. I know uh, there, there have been some problems in countries where, the, where people decide they weren't going to have children hardly anymore. So the country said, we're going to start rewarding people for having children. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's difficult to me when the government starts trying to to play too big of a role in what people do and what they don't do. I'd say let people have a choice. Mm -hmm. We're getting a little political here, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is you know, what, Ed, his question was about segregating uh, boys and girls. Did we answer that question? Um, not quite. Because I think, I think ultimately that isn't the most important thing. It's at home. What happens to your children at home? Segregating them um, makes them want to be together more, uh, I think. But that, that may be a good thing. Uh, it depends on the school. Yeah. It depends on so many things. Uh, I think in certain years I would have loved to be in a segregated school because I, I thought boys were different. and. So before I liked boys, I thought they were kind of weird. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was the point I was going to make because from my personal experience, I have to say that uh, taking into account future, like uh, like what what uh, happened after these kids uh, became adults and got married and so on, I would say that uh, non-segregated school, like mine, uh, it was in general uh, a negative experience and it taught negative though? things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the key things, I think, and uh, I remember the name now, it's uh, Leonard Sachs is the name of the, it's a teacher from Canada, I think, who, who promotes the gender segregated uh, schools, schooling. Yeah, it sounds very expensive. And I, I like the idea of 
children learning to get along with one another and Me learn too. proper learn proper behavior and respect for one another and mm -hmm. it, to me it, it's probably good that they they do that over the years rather than the they're time. separated and all of a sudden they're thrown together i would it's say solid. i would say there's an advantage to having them together but teaching them good principles as to how to get along and respect one another not be abusive and, and uh, you know not not necessarily uh, make them feel like uh, they shouldn't be around a person of the opposite sex. I think it's too dangerous. Or to, you know, sometimes what's, what you can't have seems awfully, awfully interesting or attractive. <laughs> and maybe more than it should. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's actually, some teachers say that, uh, yeah, girls' presence in, during teen years uh, destroys the, uh, the learning process because the, the boys at a certain age they just can, cannot focus and, mm -hmm. and yeah. girls tend to, to, to wear uh, pro well maybe it's not politically correct but they do tend to wear uh, some uh, provocative clothes well, right. that's, that's what yeah. they do and at the same time the, 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 the boys they just cannot focus <laughs> yeah yeah, so and the I'm girls not. just like it. It's it's like a, a, a and that's wrong. An everyday everyday I mean, entertainment. Needs to not allow that to happen. I mean that I don't know what Dick's, I'm sure they agree with me. But I mean if if girls are allowed to wear provocative clothing to high school, then the high school isn't a good high school because I know our high school have very strict rules. Not strict enough for me. And the parents who wanted strict dress code rules pay for their kids to go to the private schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It's only natural that a guy would be distracted by a woman who's wearing short shorts and a tank top in the classroom. I mean, well, they have testosterone. They, they I mean, go through puberty and they can't help some of these things, but no, it's natural. Of course. Very girls can be very distracting. Even women can be. Yep. <laughs> yes, we, we should know. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, can you imagine a book uh, called uh, Fascinating Manhood and what could it look like? Well, actually, my dad wrote a book called Man of Steel and Velvet for men. Yep. And um, it sold about a half a million copies. And don't read self-help books as much, but um, it was successful. Like and um, yeah, it, he he did write he did write one, and it needs to be um, updated. updated too. But yeah. we just haven't done well. It has to be updated by a man, not me. I'm not doing it. <laughs> That's I'm not a man. Bob. It You're needs to be Bob's job. It needs to be written by a man and updated by a man. I'm, I, well, your your mother, I think, encouraged your dad to do it because there were so many women that said this is fascinating. Womanhood is really helpful for us. What about the men? And so he decided he would write this book, and he called it The Man of Steel and Velvet because uh, an author, Carl Sandburg, described Abraham Lincoln as a man of steel and velvet. In other words, he had a lot of strength, but he also had some kindness and sensitivity qualities, and that that combination was uh, maybe sort of an ideal man, a man of steel and a man of velvet. Love the combination. So the book really addresses that concept, and maybe that's what you're talking about, is a book for men, uh, you know, such as The Man of Steel and Velvet. Do you Velvet. have a copy, Jen? Do you have I, Well, I have the, the Man of Steel and Velvet. This oh, is yeah. a book, Very Sergei, good. and you can buy it on Amazon. I don't know if it's translated in Russian, but Sergei's... Oh, uh, is it still available? French. I don't think it's in oh, Russian. Oh, I just bought this one a few months ago. Yes, oh, it's yes. still available. Oh, okay. Didn't, That's interesting. Yeah, but it's all used. It's and not, it's not. You got oh, they're all used. They're, it's not in print. These are all used books. And then there's the fascinating girl. And now, is this for being young, young women, unmarried. For young, right, unmarried women. And isn't this being translated in Russian? Yes. 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 It, yeah. Exmo has that one, too. They want that. Okay. And all about raising all, children. And, and her book for uh, mothers on raising children is called All About Raising Children. Do you have that one? That's being that I edited all these, of course, and then we have Helen's this one, all about raising children, 
Now, and then you have the classic fascinating womanhood. As you can see, that's basically mm -hmm. a Bible for me for a long time. And then the wonderful revision of Helen's book. Uh, this is the vintage edition revised and edited by Dixie, removing some of the things that you we talked about, I guess, a few videos ago. Yeah. Um, and then the long awaited book, Timeless, fascinating womanhood for the timeless woman when is it coming out <laughs> i know i know I, it's not it's at the part where i can't do anything it's nothing it's editing i got nothing to show you well my my um editing my and son richard, our son richard is, running is very picky and he, he is every word making sure every comma is in the right place because i'm not as you know, I, I was an English major in college, but I, I'm not as good at it as him. <laughs> so that's that's all we're waiting for is that. I have to go. I think uh, I tried to look for fascinating girl on Amazon. It's it's. I think it's not available there, at least on, on American. It, it, Amazon. It's, it, it isn't. I don't it know. Is. It's available it's, from the Author House. Is, there's a there's a publisher called Author House, and we still let them publish it. We can. Uh, we can discontinue with them anytime we want, but they still, they st are you sure it's not on? I can, I can go buy a fascinating girl right now, hardcover, the one I just showed you for $12.48. Where? I've got a fascinating girl um, paperback I can buy new for nineteen ninety five. Okay, I will, I will double oh, check. It's there. Interesting. But it's 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 going to be in Russian. We need to hear from Exmo to find out because they said that they'll come up with cover art and send it to us for approval. They said they've translated it, but I haven't received any cover art, so I don't know where they're at with it. It's, it's got to be close. It's got to be close. Hey, and I've got a copy of Band and uh, of Steel and Velvet. Wow, they're expensive because there's so few of them. Well, they're not anything that somebody pre-owned because it's not in print. Oh, they, these are all used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I... Um, Do you have eBay? Sergey, if you ever come across a woman who likes fascinating womanhood in Russia, we need, <laughs> we we need, need a Russian woman who can speak English that can help us with the teaching program there. We've got Exmo, but we don't have any teachers yet. Well, I will do my best, but I have to, to tell you, maybe it uh, speaks more about me than about women, but I can't really say that I've ever met a woman like that or even heard of. I, I, I met uh, girls who tried tried to, by the way, I could, I could uh, yeah, do a sidestep and uh, at a certain point where our, my own marriage was uh, near breakup, uh, my wife tried, I think, to, to implement the ideas which she read about, I think it was five, six years before that. And uh, I got a very unpleasant experience actually about it because it was so... <clears throat> I experienced this as so, um, I have to say, artificial, yeah? like like, a, like a, a person is doing it like under a gun. Somebody is holding a gun to, to, to her behind and, and, and she's right. trying to do it. It's, it's actually the, the emotions that I got from it was uh, uh, negative. From pity to, to sorry for her to to disgust that, that's uh, yeah. 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 no I've seen that too I've seen that too when a person approaches this as a technique or a technology it has to be authentic it has to be authentic and some people used to complain that it was manipulative and uh, the answer to that is manipulation depends on your motive if your motive is selfish to get something that you want that the other person just takes away from them it's manipulative like if you try to get your husband to buy you a mink coat and that's your goal if your goal is to have a a really happy romantic marriage that helps him too then it's not then it's good psychology it's, you have to work on yourself you have to work on yourself you're not you and you know i'm not surprised i constantly with women have to say to them you know you can't change him you've got to change you yeah and they, you just have to keep saying it and saying it. They, they'll say things to the effect of, how can I get my husband to do this? This is not technique. This no. is principle-driven. Principle and 
one of the core things is you've got to accept a man, any, any person really, including your children, at face value, meaning it's like you, you accept what is. It doesn't mean that you always agree with everything he does. He may have a bad habit that is not really even good, but you accept it instead of, instead of him being your project where you're trying to change him. You change you. You can accept people. You can be tolerant. You can um, think, well, he throws his socks on the floor, but I'm not a very good cook. I mean, you... you, it, you fascinating know. womanhood is about character. It's the foundation. Yeah. It is. It's about character and and learning to work on yourself. It's appropriate to work on yourself all day long. First, nobody likes to be somebody else's project. I don't like it. I don't think you like it. And so, to oh, look at this! I got someone. Someone's trying to call me. One of our teachers. You you could bring her in. <laughs> Come on, from Canada. Oh, is it Kalan? It's Kalan. She's actually um, a counselor, isn't she? Yeah, she's a public speaker. Um, quite a fascinating woman, actually. Should I get her back? Sure, if you want. As for finding a, a person for, I would, I would love to ha to help you, but I can't really. I don't know. Just you know, in time, this is coming out in Russian, and there'll be people uh, interested. This is a worldwide program it's uh it's it's got people we're we're getting responses really from people all over the world africa asia europe did you say there's a lot of people in russia that speak english well, well i i say yes okay because yeah. uh, we don't have any teacher there yet we do we have one that just joined from saudi arabia and there's that one from ukraine but i haven't had any russian yet and I would love to get a really solid Russian woman who could speak English so I could communicate. And there was one years ago when my mother was alive, but I don't know where she is now. Church actually looks uh, in my in, in in one's mind. Church looks like a good place to to search, but in McDowell community, churches have been long. Uh, how to say? disproved as a good uh, way to to meet good uh, women because there many of them just go there for the same reason and just as a one one more way to uh, to get a husband and that's all and are manipulative that's the foundation of the MGTOW lifestyle is that women are manipulative well, some, are, uh, some are but some are and some, some are some but it's it's not fair to lump everybody into one pot because they're not most women Really, all, I keep saying all people want to be happy. They just don't know how to get it. Yeah, and and some people are bad character. They're selfish and mm -hmm. immature, and that's tough. I understand that uh, many of them, maybe even most of them, are not are not doing it by choice, and they're yeah. not not doing this uh, harm. They just don't know any better. No, nobody taught yes. them. Yes. And oh, there she is. Pre previously, I, I told about this, uh, the cast, uh, about the priority, the husband priority number one. Yeah. Uh, I made a link to, to uh, an Orthodox priest who said exactly the same thing, and but he said it stronger. That was a stronger message. So what a pr one priest said that... And, and like a lot of uh, people who call themselves uh, Orthodox, uh, they could not accept this message. They say, you, you are misreading the scripture, you are... You you are wrong, something like this. You, you could cannot accept this. You could, cannot. That's that's some some kind of blockage there. That, I don't know. And and these these are people who go to an orthodox site. So they're they're not not random people. They are people from yeah. the church, and and they cannot accept what the, <laughs> what the a person is a priest is telling them. They reject it. And that's all. Yeah, that's that's really sad too. But speaking from our experience, I know there's women who would, if there are men like you, I would love to find somebody like that. Mm -hmm. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Hi. 
Well, we are uh, in in the midst of talking with Sergey, who found us, I think, last week and maybe even just five days ago. It seems to have happened very quickly, and we're just talking about some pretty heavy issues um, and um, uh, about fascinating womanhood, the movement, the pro-feminine movement. Uh, Sergey is amazing, and he's asking some really awesome questions. And it's um, we'd love for you know you're you're going to bring in a totally different perspective on some of his questions. So why don't we continue to to do that unless you guys have another plan because this is totally random. That's okay if you're okay, Glenn. Speaking of tough subjects, we came on uh, on the very of question i already sent you links to uh, to yeah. a little bit uh, uh, to, to get familiar with uh, the red pill documentary which came out last year and uh, uh, earlier there was a documentary called divorce corp i think a year before that and uh, the stuff that they are talking about and the uh, in more general sense, uh, men's movements, father's rights groups, and so on. What can you take? Uh, what's your take on all of it? Oh, you mean you all know, these do you know what red pill means? Did you guys watch the video that I sent over on the red pill or some of it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know who wants to speak. Go ahead, yeah. Well, you know, Chuck, you're asking about what we think about these movements? Uh, it's more interesting to speak about the actual um, actual events and and the uh, uh, social devices they describe. Yeah, the, the, the how how things are, and uh, and the way people react to it. Yeah. Fascinating womanhood is a very positive movement, but some of these things are they just like feminist movement. And I think Magtao is that how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. they, they any any group that that kind of um, keeps people and supports people being victims. When you're in a victim position, it puts you in a weaker position. It makes it so you feel like you're powerless and you can't do anything. There's all this power out here and you're a victim. But when you, when you are, stay more positive or in a positive group that, that uh, is in the act of, of learning and doing something positive, it gives you more strength, more power, and that's the, the problem with some of these, some of them. Um, Fascinating Womanhood is a positive, pro-feminine movement. It's not, it doesn't complain about our victim status. We can actually do something about it instead of, instead of feeling like, uh, angry. No, we're not angry all the time. That, no, we're... we're I, I Oh, sorry. I, I watched it, a, a large part of that, the red pill. And um, I do think that it has very valid points for uh, the problem men. I know I can only speak for American men because that's all I know. And the, the problems that they face in the court system. And my ex, my uh, current husband, um, we're both uh, divorced and remarried to each other and um, went through a terrible situation with his first wife and the court system. So, but I in turn also had a lot of, and I shared this with you, Sergey. the court system was very unfair to me when things were done to me to take my children away, even though I had been the one supporting them. But I did watch the movie and I think there were some points made, but the problem is what the whole thing is, is like just what Dixie said, you cannot pinpoint one, like, because I'm a woman, I'm exactly like all women because I'm not. And neither are you like all men. It's just not fair to say that. And it actually doesn't hold up. It's not a good argument. No, it's not. Just like you, you've often said during these interviews, well, some, some men feel this way. I don't feel exactly like that. All men are not the same. All women are not the same. So everyone has to be case by case basis, which takes longer and is harder. But that's what, what is real. Did you have any thoughts, Kalan? We've sort of left you out. Yeah. She probably doesn't know. Does she know about the red pill, I wonder, and the MGTOW movement? Sorry okay. about that. Um, no, I don't. Um, however, uh, like you said, all men are not the same, and all women are not the same. Mm -hmm. And so because of our differences, 
uh, because of our differences and what we stand for. Some people stand for, um, let's say for men, some men may stand for being praised and some men may fall victim to that name where, you know, like you said, they're labeling all men in the court system as being the same. Mm -hmm. so, I think uh, there should be some, some sort of um, organization or something like that that can help those men who are innocent of that name, help them basically to come out and say, you know, I'm a good man. I, I, I know how to take care of my family, mm -hmm. how to take care of my children. I'm not like that. And even train men who has been preying on other, on women, right, who are guilty of that name. Train them to become better men. Uh, we're, all, we're all capable of doing what is right, doing good. So, yeah, that's how I see it. Well, you know, and also when you talk about court system, uh, each court has its own judge and all judges are not the same. Yeah. Right. And some exactly. judges uh, may side more, tend to side more on the favor of the woman, some on the man. It's not all the same. Right. So. Yeah, but again, if we're talking about statistics, and I, I had a lawyer on the interview, a lawyer who spent all his life in court. So he, he says the statistics are quite representative. So... Of, there is no, nothing, nothing right. close to equality regarding. Uh, oh, that so. women uh, typically get custody of the children. Yes, ch children yeah, property. Know, uh, is I this in Russia that. or the the America? Where what poll is this in Russia? Uh, because it's, it's not a poll. It's it's a, it's a it's a lawyer lawyer for Canada from Vancouver. Yeah. I have two daughters who were divorced and both lost custody of their children to their husbands. One was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. The one husband was an alcoholic. She lost custody of her children. So the statistics in my family do not say that at all. In fact, it's very dangerous for women. I guess my, my, guess my, my girls don't fight hard enough or something. They lost custody of their children, and it was devastating. And so this lawyer's from Canada. Kalana, you're in Canada? You're from I'm, Canada? I'm in Canada, and um, during the summer, I was in court as well for my daughter. Um, I have an eight-year-old daughter who I struggled for the last eight years with her father not being in her life and want, want to basically come in and out. And, you know, I, I tried my best to speak good of him towards my daughter, but at the same time, I protected her by going to court and getting uh, full custody of her. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that is a case where the man is guilty of such name. You gotta be, you have to be responsible for your family, for your children as a man. And if that is not taking place, then steps need to be taken. Well, yeah, Sergey, what does the movement say about you know men? Um, obviously, the men who MGTOW men want to be responsible, right, for their families, because their argument is. We want to be uh, providers and the courts aren't letting us or, or uh, they're not letting us to be in our kids' lives. Well, actually, that was long before McDowell appeared. I think uh, Warren Farrell talked about this in his books, which are already, I think, 40 or 30 years ago, about the problems with uh, alimony and what are the causes. And it's not secret. There, yeah. there, there are scientific uh, studies on this subject. For, for example, it's well known that uh, men tend to pay uh, harder and less than it's forced through a third party, like an agency. It's well known. So it, it's very easy to correct. You just have to... What are you let, saying? Let, let, the, let the men do this, not, not force, uh, like uh, take some, some bigger force and force him to do it. So, oh, I yeah, I was divorced my first marriage and my husband never paid child support until I had to go through the system as I raised my three children on $18,000 a year, which in America is, is poverty level. So, I mean, I, I had to go through the system to get 
child support and to this day I will never get what supposedly he owed and it doesn't matter he and I are friends now and we love our kids and they're raised and we worked it out but but, but I mean, fascinating womanhood is about and women should pay marriages too, not not figuring exactly. out divorce yeah these are those political issues that fascinating womanhood is only speaking to about people who want good marriages who want to save their marriages and uh saying that there's no only, need for a divorce court yeah there isn't right. and, and women own the key to that Yes, I, I agree with that. I agree that being a, a woman who's married now and looking at my husband, he, he is adorable in, in manner, in, in the fact that he wants to be my husband and wants to be the father of my daughter. Um, he's not even her biological father, but when you look at them together, it's as if they even have the same attitudes. and and. When I see him with her, when I see the way he is, I know number one, there's a God, and mm -hmm. then number two, Amen to there that. Are good men out there. Oh, lots. lots. Yep. Lots of them, and it's just because they may not have been, um, you know, treated with such admiration and respect as they deserve. Right. Because of that, they, 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 you know, they, they tend to build that wall. And it takes a woman who actually knows how to bring out that love and that, 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 that tenderness in a man. Inspire is the word we say. Him. Yeah. And when that happens, I mean, he is like a flower opening up for you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I would like to clarify the, the reason why I put this question in. That uh, the reason is not to to uh, I don't know maybe make women responsible for this or, or, or even even less so uh, fascinating womanhood. The reason I think is uh, nowadays it's better to educate fascinating women on these subjects because that's what good men are faced with. That's where they. Yes. See the risks, and uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the system is. Uh, I don't know the reasons for that, but the system seems to be organized so, so that uh, good people get hurt and bad people get advantage, and uh, there's just not enough uh, checks and balances in the system. So uh, one one of the, I think it was a YouTuber named Stardusk, a very f famous person. I think he. he uh, put uh, an analogy to what it's like for a man to to nowadays go into a marriage and an analogy is like this so suppose there is a, a collar and a collar with a bomb in it and there is a remote control so basically uh, when you're getting into marriage nowadays at least in the western world yeah, in, uh, in english-speaking countries and not, not only english-speaking uh, a woman by the hand of a government puts this collar with a bomb uh, on the neck of a husband and he cannot take it off. And she gets the remote control yeah, and it's always with her, one way or another. There are many, many buttons actually, there's a choice what you can do. And she may say all, all, all the way she wants that I will not press these buttons, never, ever. I will cross my heart, hope to die. Still, the, the collar is on. The button is live, and at any time, just for any reason, she can press it. That, that's how it's viewed. It's maybe a little bit exaggerated, but it gets the picture of what, what men get into when they go into marriage. Those who understand what they're getting into. Those who do not understand, they're just you know, romantic and uh, do not get the clear picture of what they're talking about. So if you, if you uh, I guess, if you want a man, to get into this system, you first you have to understand this that he take what come what kind of decision he has to have, uh, and it's not not so very uh, not pleasant in any way, and it actually puts uh, puts a question to 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 a developed woman. Yeah, uh, is it really okay to do such thing with a person I supposedly love? Is it okay to put a collar with a bomb on on him? Absolutely not. But that's generally how the marriage is uh, is working now.
Well, not, not, not so much in, in Russia yet, but they're working on it definitely. So it's, it's, go, it's going to be the same in a few that years. Gives, I don't understand that at all. I get, that gives women a lot of power, and I know a lot of women that think that that's more true for men. Because, because the men have the power. Because yeah. a woman gets pregnant, and she's vulnerable, and he can just leave, and she has the baby. She has to figure it out. So I've never heard of that before, and I feel so bad that some men feel that way. Me too. Well, I, I could see a woman saying the same thing. A man does that with her, too. He puts a collar on her. So, you know, really, both people have a responsibility, I think, mm -hmm. to find out how to make this work rather than say, you know, who's got a collar on who. In a way, I, I, I've heard many women say, you know, women are at such a disadvantage in a relationship because we're the ones that get pregnant. He's the one that's got all the power and the control. So really, to, rather than decide who's got the collar on who, I'd say let's look at what are the principles that can help a relationship be the best it can be and not focus on who's got the power or who's going to hurt who. To me, that goes into a, a relationship expecting a lot of problems rather than saying what can we build I don't understand why a man who thinks that about marriage would ever get married yeah I, I agree. Or would even like want to be with a woman at all because it's my, my point exactly and the point okay. of a lot of people you have sex drive and uh, usually that involves women so MGTOWs want a life without women it's not what it's generally not what they want. That's uh, I think a lot of them just feel that they're forced into this. There are several. For first of all, there are what they call robosexuals. Yeah, people who very much anticipate and like the idea of uh, artificial women, and it's coming already. Oh, coming. He's going to bring that up. Just, just I'm, I'm not uh, making no, any judgment. So that's just one of the ways. Yeah, one. That's of the ways. just that's just sex. Some There's people are called mechtel monks, so they go monk. Right. So they refuse sex. To, it, it's it, the the danger. The, at, at least the perceived danger is so high that they say, "Okay, I'm done with it." No. But that's, what's so sad is when what what is so sad is then they they give up on something that is so amazing that's still there, and that they give up when it's actually still possible. Yeah. And, and it's it's not it's not impossible, but they have just given up, and it's so sad because robots are never going to have a relationship. That's just that's just physical. or I have a child and create a family. I mean, no, they'll never they they can never understand you and sympathize with you and support your dreams. They can't do any of that. They can't even accept you at face value because they don't care. They're just inanimate objects, and even if they teach them to kind of talk they don't love so but that's exactly what happens in most marriages just saying well, well, most marriages my goodness in, the, in this sense there's not not much difference actually a robot yeah. might be a little bit better and then but, average but then, but then there's marriages like like i have and like jenny has and my sisters my sisters and i have been there's and my parents who are still and living my, okay and my my sisters and a sister-in-law Every year we go to my hometown, Santa Barbara, California. We have sisters reunion. We didn't even think about this till one of our friends there said, you, you all are married to the same person all these years? Yeah. You're all friends? Yeah. And I, and I was thinking, you know, if, if several of our marriages, if we'd been married to several different people, it might be, the dynamics might be totally different. Mm -hmm. But we were all fortunate to be raised with fascinating womanhood and we were also fortunate to have been attracted to good men. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not perfect men. They're, they're basically really good men. So we're really close. And we have this relationship. We go every year and have just sisters where we talk and about our children. We have raised 45 children between five sisters, five of us. One's a sister-in-law. And we figure we deserve a break. <laughs> but it's fun but part of the fun is we don't we don't ever have stories about bad husbands or divorce or uh, abuse or uh, we don't ever talk about how awful men are uh, there we all talk about how we miss our husbands actually when we're gone but this this is real 
this exists. And so for people to say, well, most don't, you know what? It's time to change that. We're tired of it. We want this pro feminine movement that we we restarted. My mother started it. We restarted it. We want it to go around the world. And I know for a fact, and so do you, Jenny, that there are so many women out there that want this, that don't know how to get it. They're so unhappy, just like the men. Mm -hmm. They don't think everything's great on their side. These women that they portray that are really selfish, they're not happy either because selfishness never makes for happiness. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's another Christian principle. We don't, we, we kept all the principles. It's probably a Muslim principle too. I just don't know that much about that. It's, um, we keep all those things there. We keep God in it. We just don't have specifically Christian. That's all. I understand that. And, and you, you, yeah, you also must understand that you're really very lucky and rare. Not as rare as you think. Maybe it is rare in Russia, though. That's it, why they it, wanted to or, translate fascinating womanhood, Dixie, is because Russia's having a problem. Well, Russian do. women are tired of it. That's what the publisher said. They are tired of it and they mm -hmm. want traditional marriage. Okay, so that tells you this big publishing company says, oh, there's a lot of interest in this. They came after us. We didn't come after them. And they're the first ones publishing this. It's, it's not, they're not coming after us in the United States. In fact, we're having kind of a problem with the publisher we have in New York because it's a leftover from my mother. And anyway, it's a long story, but the Russian publishers are actually coming after us. So, um, so that tells you to help your marriages. <laughs> Still, I think uh, for, for a fascinating woman, uh, at least for a fascinating girl, it's, it would be very, uh, it would be to her advantage to, to, to see the Red Pill movie and to get a little bit inside the head of a, an average man. Or maybe even a man better than average because well, it's hurt. Fascinating womanhood is going to teach these women how to understand men mm -hmm. and, and, and how to uh, support men and how to help them to inspire more masculinity and how to believe in their dreams and, uh, and, and be sympathetic to their uh, concerns and their worries and appreciate the fact that they're masculine. That's what we, we teach. So it's men, men tend to love fascinating women because it supports men. Yes, that, that's what makes it so attractive. I've heard men say, uh, they said, my wife read something. I don't know what, what it is, but I like it. Whatever it is, keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. is it safe to say that you stand for a traditional family? Yeah. Yes. And then how do you define it? Because there are many, many definitions. Mm. Well, you know, there's, there's, different, there's different situations that people have, and we realize that everything is not always perfect. But if you're going to talk about ideal, uh, a, a man and a woman married with their family, whether they are able to have any children or not, or whether their children are grown, and it involves husband and wife in their home, raising children, or their children are grown with grandchildren, or they're just starting out and don't have any. And that's what traditional family is. I just read an interesting uh, Harvard study, and you can Google it, you can look it up. Uh, a 75 year. 75 years study. Study. They, they were trying to find what really leads to happiness for people. And they're looking at things like, you know, fame and wealth and success in business okay. and all kinds of different things. And they came up with one, uh, they came up with one conclusion. In fact, I think I've got it right here. I just looked it up. Uh, it says, the clearest message from this 75 year study from Harvard is, Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. Mm -hmm. So the, what they basically said was that they found that the quality of relationships that people have in their life, and I think they're meaning uh, very much the personal relationships that they have, determines how happy they are overall. It's not wealth. It's not fame. It's not position or degrees or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's the quality of their relationships 
And that is the thing that contributes most to their overall happiness. And the core of that is their relationship with the opposite gender, with a, a right. spouse. Right. Because that's the most personal, not friends. Friends yeah. are, are good. Other family members are good. And that's because there's intimacy, which is an extremely important part of, 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 of a really good relationship. Because my, my, family, my family knows me. I grew up with my parents, but they don't know the personal side of me that I give only to him. And, and I don't know the personal side of my children, what they give to their spouses. That's very personal and intimate. And it's the best. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like the heart of the watermelon or the, the mm -hmm. very best thing. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can have that, that's why, you know, she passed away. But Elizabeth Taylor, she was married eight times because she still hoped, she still believed maybe it was possible to have that. That's what she was hoping for and wanted. And that's why you think, why would she keep getting married? Because she still hoped that it would be what she dreamed it would be. Mm -hmm. I think I saw a TED talk on something like this on the subject, like a longitudinal study on the, what factors are in common for people who, who live longer, maybe yeah. longer yeah. than 100 years. The okay. relationship, I think there were uh, 12 or 11 points and the relationships uh, on, was one of the key points there, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just hope, I would just hope that you, I don't think you're like this, Sergey, but I would hope that you would please don't give up on that because it it is possible. And we're doing our best to try and make it more possible than it has been. <clears throat> I'm at a difficult situation in this regard. First of all, I, I don't very much believe it is possible. Yeah? I know my chances. I'm, I'm clear about them. So I, I keep a little bit of hope, but it's, that's all. Well, it, it, hey, just I, keep I'm, I'm, I'm the custodial. That's all he needs is a little bit of hope. That's all he needs a little bit. I'm a custodial father of a son. What's that? So I'm a custodial father of a son. How mm -hmm. old is he? 16. So I think it's, well, men, men uh, sometimes are okay with foster children. Women are much worse with foster children. So I have two stepsons. I don't even this. this uh, it depends on the woman. The, I, I have two stepsons, and the reason they did come to live with us full time is because Jeff married me, and he was now able to provide a really stable home for his boys. And, and he talked to his ex-wife and they all decided the boys would live with Jeff because at boys in that uh, age, they were 12 and 14, really important to be with their dad. And they came to live with us because, I mean, I, you say things that are so black and white that just don't fit. Everyone. A everyone. I love my stepsons. I was such a great stepmom to them. My daughter is married a second time, and she's a wonderful mother to her stepson. She loves him. And uh, Kalan, her husband, she just oh, said, yeah. treated her, yeah. you he know, that's a stepdaughter husband. like his own. My father raised my mother's two oldest daughters from her first marriage. He adopted them, and it's like they are, are his own. I've got to go. Okay. Bob's got to okay. go. Okay, Bob's got to go. Yeah. Doctor's got to go. When you gotta go. Uh, my point was that uh, his mom is quite okay. Yeah, she's a, a nice woman. So I, I can't possibly. It's it's not would be non, It wouldn't be wise for me to put him in such a conflict. Yeah, I, I don't want that. It's because yeah. the, pro, the pros are not outweighing the cons. The cons when he grows up, when becomes an adult, would you consider dating if you obviously found the right woman? Dating, yeah, I, I, totally I, off. I do dating. I'm, I'm a mecto who connects with women, so. But you don't bring them around your son. Never. He, he doesn't know how, how what, uh, what, what was, what's her or their names. Uh, if there are any, any of them already or not, nothing. Zero. What do you teach your son about, if you want to share, what do you teach your son about women? Uh, Generally, I was actually the person who translated the Red Pill movie to, to Russia. Uh, 
So and I got permission for that directly from from the uh, uh, the director. Wow! And my son helped me a little bit with it and with technical part and so on. so so he he knows. So I I don't I don't paint all of it black. I, I just basically tell him the same things. I tell, yeah, it's it's a very very risky uh, environment. Uh, the the stakes are high. The risks are high. But you have such and such and such and such uh, variants. So just weight them really, really well, really critically. And well, he, he understands it. Yeah. In, in, in the new book, and there's a chapter that talks about, you know, when we talked before in one of the segments on relationship development, if you would develop your relationship in the right order, you'll know before you get married whether this isn't going to be a good idea. Right. You have a gr greater chance of knowing, I think I better get out of this, rather than you actually get married and, oops, you know, you, you made a terrible mistake because you didn't really get to know them on a real personal level. Yeah, we need to bring back courtship. Yeah, where you actually know the person, their heart, and yeah. not just, and you know, you know, to find out if a woman's selfish, you can find that out before you marry them, yeah. in most cases. Some, some women are pretty good at it, and some men aren't very great at figuring it out. But generally speaking, if you develop your relationship in the order, intellectual, then emotional, then spiritual. A lot of people leave that out altogether. Yeah. And then they and then they jump to physical before they really even know them. Mm -hmm. And then then there's all these chemicals that get involved, oxytocin stuff, these bonding things, and you think, I am so in love, and you really don't you haven't taken the time to build build that foundation where you that person is really kind of knows your soul. And that's, that's what you want. That's what you need. And it's, that's the safest way to do it. It makes it the least high risk. Well, actually, it's only my opinion, and well, maybe a fraction of people, but uh, I, I came to appreciate the, uh, a distance, a certain distance between people. So I, I know I, a lot I, of people who wait, like you, so um, to date And, and that's what, in Fascinating Woman, we call that a wall of reserve. And uh, most men have it. Some have very deep walls, some less deep. But it took me, and Bob was not even married before. It took me probably five years being married to him before he really deeply trusted me. He wouldn't give me all of that until after we were married. But he gave me enough. It wasn't all. But he gave me enough so that I could feel. I knew kind of his personality. And... Um, that doesn't mean uh, sometimes people change after they're married. They'll start drinking or using drugs. It changes their personality. There's nothing is 100% foolproof. But you said the stakes are high, but so is the reward. The reward is incredibly high. There's nothing like it. And to give up on it like there's no chance isn't true either. It's not true because I've seen it thousands of times, thousands of times, not here and there rare and i've lived it and, so, lived it. and i know so many who have lived it so well, it, it's like a, uh, i think all of us um, each one of us knows at least one person who won a lottery yeah but still we prefer it's going I worked at it i worked at it to win the lottery then i if, if that's possible it's not you, luck you have to you have to luck. develop yourself you devote it yeah you need you need, Sergey. you need a woman of character. Yeah. Number one. That's what he does not have. Yeah. No, you don't have it. Have you ever met one? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure, actually, I won't, <laughs> I won't to anymore. Uh, well, one of the reasons, by the way, it's, it's also uh, worth mentioning, uh, just, just as, a, as a side note, I, I grew up with a foster dad. And okay. It's safe to say that my family was quite dysfunctional. And that's one of the reasons I, I don't quite believe in foster parenting at all. So I, I don't think it's a good idea. It, it's, it's, a, it's again, it's a, I think it's a, a thing for, for a chosen few. Foster or adopted? Adopted or foster? What's a foster dad? I don't... Maybe, maybe it's my English. Uh, 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 the man who married my mother after she divorced. Okay, that's, uh, you're a step. He was your stepdad. Okay, stepdad. Okay, 
So, uh, and, and step parents are sometimes wonderful and sometimes they're evil. And mm -hmm. I would say most of the time, nothing good comes of it. At best, it's neutral. At best, uh, I have several friends who who uh, who grew grew up and it's approximately my situation. At best, it's neutral. That's this world that you live in comprises the people that you know, but it isn't yeah. the entire planet. And yeah, sure. the world that I live in, the world that I know, it's not nearly that dismal. The it, world that I know is not like that at all either, except... It, it, you know, and, and the world that I live in also includes my husband's practice, which has a lot of dysfunctional families, but they are, the, they are not the majority. They are, uh, they are still kind of a minority. I believe that most people, maybe you're going to say I'm crazy, most people want the right thing. They may not know how to get it. They may be dysfunctional, but they are basically want to be good. They don't want to be bad. I, I, I agree to that. I agree yeah. with Sergey. I, I optimally, your your mom and dad were together and raised you. Absolutely. It is it. It's suboptimal to have a step parent in a way. It. I agree with that. Not a deal. It's. It is. I totally agree with that. I can see where that was maybe not ideal for you. The story is that most people, like like myself, who grew up in a situation approximately like this, they tend to what is called collect father figures. Yeah. So we, if we uh, meet somebody who is approximately a father's age, and that we tend to, if a person is warm to you, we tend to, I would say, a little cling a little bit, maybe even more than it's healthy. And there mm -hmm. are several. So actually, my whole life could be traced with uh, collecting. I think uh, at this. Uh, point in time this person was this uh, uh, father figure at this point another at this point another I had several of them I still have some of them now several of them and some of them uh, went through divorces and of course we discussed these subjects and I asked uh, and we discussed this uh, area and after my divorce also and uh, I don't think Maybe one of them only, uh, of, of five or six, said that, yeah, you could take a pause and then you could try to start again very carefully. Uh, other, they say that it's better not to because uh, and they describe how their life went. So I know at least, uh, I don't know, five or six stories very, oh. very personally. Okay, Sergey, yeah. um, your whole life then, in my opinion, I is uh, uh, the reason for fascinating womanhood. And I don't know what happened to your father and, and I don't need to know, but be, we are all about that, that family that raises kids with the balance of masculine and feminine in a, in a marriage relationship. That's, you, you know what I mean? It's like almost like your whole childhood and, and what's going on with you right now is the whole reason for fascinating womanhood. It's the argument for fascinating womanhood, why it's so important. Yes, yes. Yeah. She's got a, you're going to lose power there? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't have it plugged in or we were on longer. And I thought, okay, there, it's okay. <laughs> that was close. So okay. I, I was saying that uh, I got a good advice from people who I really trust. I, I know, the, at least from, from uh, like a father-son thing. Eh? So they tend to say that keep it, keep it distant. Do not risk it. It's not worth it. The risks are too high. Consider this. Consider this, Sergey. Um, Bob and I like to do this with things. We say, if everybody, if everybody did this, what would the world be like? If everyone was, if everyone was honest, how would the world change? Boy, it'd be change a lot, wouldn't it? If everyone was kind to everybody, how would the world change? How about this? If everyone was. Um, Homosexual, how would the world change? Well, it doesn't really work very good for civilization. Let me give you an example of why this does not work. Okay. Let's pretend everybody is a woman. It doesn't work. There's no... Yeah. Does, does, it mean that, does it mean there's that... Uh, uh, and, and the same for men, yeah? So all men... If everyone is a man, there's no civilization. So you need both, yeah? Yes, yeah, Just, just an example, this, this, this logic does not work always. No. no, the logic is if everybody did something, if everybody, if everybody adopted this attitude, you don't need the opposite sex. You don't need that marriage or, or family. What would happen to the world? It wouldn't work very good. So 
So it, it is, you know it doesn't work because Sergey was raised in that family, in the split family, and has, you know, I don't know. I, I think your whole, what you were just saying is the whole reason why fascinating womanhood and strong marriages are the reason, the, the argument too, why it's so important. It is so I important. agree. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to, to, for any group of people to kind of give up is tragic because we're seeing, we're seeing marriages, we're seeing marriages uh, blossom and grow and get strong and romantic. And people write to us all the time and say, this is absolutely transformative. And the men are happy. It's not just about the woman's happiness. The men are happy. Of course. It's, it's about <laughs> men's happiness. It's about yes. women's happiness. In fact, there's one, one woman that said, our marriage has changed so much. My husband wasn't going to, didn't want me to teach fast in one womanhood, but it's changed our marriage so much. He's now supporting me. He wants me to teach others to help them because mm -hmm. it's so transformed. So for people to say, well, in my experience out there, this is high risk behavior. So don't do it. I just think, no, don't give up. It's, it's maybe difficult, but it is not hopeless. It is absolutely not hopeless. On, I mean, look at you, on, on, gi on giving up, I, I, I could I could do it vice versa because actually, if if uh, I'm not not making a conscious effort, then I tend to I, I can see it in myself. I tend to go again to to the usual thing, and the usual thing would be dating, romantics, and so on. So it actually takes uh, a lot of control, self control, self consciousness to to keep yourself under this. Uh, monitor what is happening yeah and and uh, it's the wall of reserve the the wall you actually you have to you have to make effort not not yeah. to to like, stay away yeah. yeah because everybody wants to be safe everyone wants to feel safe men do women all do. build up a wall and we, we do we do when we have unhappy and unpleasant experiences but to make that decision that therefore this is uh, not worth it. All women are like this, and if I even talk to a woman, they're going to ruin my life forever. For example, I know I know men in this country that have said, and they've actually done it. I cannot find a feminine woman anywhere around. True. They go to South America, they go to Asia, because women there are tend to be still more feminine, because <clears throat> feminism hasn't been there as long, and they they find more traditional women, so they'll go out of this country to find it, but they. At least they haven't given up. Uh, this, I sometimes hear the same about Russian women. It's uh, it's disproven on YouTube many times by people who, who actually got married to these women from Asia, from Russia. I don't know what they're talking about because I know people who've done it. I don't know where these statistics come from. Who these who these uh, yeah, th these are more stories than statistics because when you when you see a person on YouTube, it's it's not statistics. It's just yeah, you so collecting would stories. You say in your experience, Sergey, that there is a lack of feminine women in Russia, in your experience? That actually d depends on what you would call a feminine. The oh, sense of fascinating womanhood, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Feminine has one definition. Go ahead, Dixie. No, not well, really. It does. Well, there's how you look, that's one. But there's who you are inside. Nature. And he's talking about who you are inside. That, and... Um, that's that's why we have this pro feminine movement. We're trying to change that, and it's a huge job. I mean, I recognize it, but I am so worried about the state of things in this world. My mother was, but it's worse now than it was when she was alive. Yeah, that's why she asked me to write a new book. That's why she told me to edit her other book because she said it's got to be. We can't lose people because of dated things in there, like women shouldn't wear pants, and things like that. What's your definition of feminine? What is a feminine woman to you? I usually go to, uh, there was a question actually later, but uh, I usually go to uh, Carl Gustav Jung yeah, and his uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. a spectrum of anima. So he basically says, I think there are six core, core archetypes. archetypes. Yeah, so yeah. at least one of them, but, but uh, each one of them could be... Uh, could work in a, in, a, in a light side or dark side. So it's, it could be feminine, but could be on a dark side. 
for example, in a House of Cards, yeah, this uh, the wife. She's, oh, you uh, mean, you watch that? Oh, of Claire, course, it says. Are, it's, are uh, you taking your definition favorites. of femininity yeah. from that? No, I mean, no, no, it's just an example. I, I usually do some kind of if I if I see interesting. Uh, are you uh, talking about person? Claire Underwood? Yeah. So yeah, but we're talking, what is the definition of femininity? When you see a woman, what's feminine? What's feminine? I have to see. I, I, I think I would have to see her in action one way or another. Once I saw a, a absolute amazing girl, and I recognized her. It was a sporting event, and I recognized her instantly as a, a Artemis. And she was an Artemis. Artemis. Maybe I'm pronouncing uh, Artemis. Artemis. Uh. Artemis. Artemis. No, the hunter goddess. Diane. Yeah. Oh. Diane. Yeah, that's what I thought that's you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So that's she was feminine in this way. So I saw it in her. She's feminine. Interesting. I, I saw this archetype in her at this moment in time. So. Would you call Claire? Me, she was an, a, a light Artemis for maybe two hours. That's, uh, Claire that's an Underwood. example. Claire Underwood is a very dangerous predator. Yep. She's not, she looks feminine. She, she, she's like Hera. Hera. She's Hera. And, and by the way, she's a, 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 a very uh, advanced Hera, both in her light side and dark side. He types also, but... Yeah. Even in the character of Claire Underwood, she's a very unhappy woman. Unhappy. She's very unhappy. She's had some divorces. She, they show her crying sometimes. She's, she's, she's very dangerous. And she's at yeah. least dangerous as Frank. She married a killer psychopath gay guy, too. I mean, I'm sorry, no. but I, I mean, mean, without the, the, any she is remorse. the worst example of a feminine woman in, in the history of society that I can think of right now. You know now. what, Sergey? Claire Underwood learned an aspect of feminine power and she manipulated it. She yep. manipulated it to use it for the dark, the dark. She and she used it. For, she uses seductive, and she uses femininity to for seduction. Whether it's for power, seduction sexually, seduction money, power. Also, I can agree, but still, that, that's that's uh, one of the things where you can see femininity. That's that's just an example. I don't. I totally disagree. It's it's superficial. It's so superficial. In fascinating womanhood, femininity is not seductive predators. No, it's not feminine. That's just that's just evil. That's criminals. It has nothing to do with. Just like in this country, some feminists are saying they talk about toxic masculinity. It's not masculinity. It's just bad behavior. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman. They try to make it seem like it's men. It isn't masculine. It's just bad behavior, evil, bad, corrupt, whatever you want to use, it's bad. And, and, and Claire Underwood was a very broken, corrupt person. So when you say feminine, she, she took on the appearance of femininity, but she's actually kind of a monster. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, she's even more chilling than, than Frank. And when you see the very last segment when she looks at the camera and says you think i haven't noticed you it's it, it still kind yeah, of i'm in control now i mean yeah you know, it's, it's like a, what feminist wrote that scene i'm serious i mean creepy. it was come it's on creepy. it it wow she's she's let's so do a creepy. class we've got to do a class on femininity and and do you is that really what you think is feminine like um i just want to understand I think he meant that, one. That's only, that's only one of the aspects. I usually describe it oh. as, as, a, as a spectrum. As, okay, a spectrum. Yeah, of course. So, so each woman, uh, basically, you can, uh, a real woman or imaginary in case of Claire, you can uh, like sort of go through a prism and see what, what she's comprised of. Uh, like the, at least uh, the six uh, main archetypes and uh, uh, each one of them on the lighter side or darker side. Well, <laughs> that's why in Fascinating how, Womanhood... How, how they are... Mm, how strong they are in this particular woman, and that's they get the, this like a uh, sort of well, sort of well, a profile. What do you think profile. about the nature of femininity? 